What the hell is going on in Norway? And what are these elite athletes doing to be so fast? In this video, I'll discuss the Norwegian method. And my threshold training is a secret to reaching your running potential faster than you think. I discovered the Norwegian method back in September of 2023 when I was on the hunt to find easier ways to run faster. And after doing more research and reading, I knew instantly that I needed to drop what I was doing and focus on this for the foreseeable future. So I started implementing one to two threshold sessions per week over the next five months. And the results were absolutely insane. And yes, today is also a threshold session because it's Tuesday. So let's get to it. And this translated to massive improvements in my 5K and 10K race times during this period. My threshold pace went from 4.05 per kilometer to 3.43 per kilometer in five months. It's insane. And this translated into massive drops in my 5K and 10K race times during this period. So clearly these Norwegian secrets work for weekend warriors like myself, as well as the best endurance athletes in the world. Later in the video, I'll break down the training of Christian Blumenfeld, Gustav Eden, and the Ingebrigtsen brothers. And I'll show you how you can implement their style of training, just like I did. But before we dig into this, we need to talk about where this Norwegian method came from and why it's unlocking insane fitness and speed improvements. This modern revolution in training starts with two Norwegian men, an accountant and a scientist. And these two guys were the brains behind the Norwegian success that's taken over two different sports. The first is Olaf Alexander Boo, a sports scientist who is pushing the peak of triathlon performance to its limits with Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden. And the results that he's been having with his athletes are truly insane. And the second, and perhaps the more out of left field character is Gert Ingebrigtsen, father of Jakob, Henrik, and Philip Ingebrigtsen. Gert was an accountant with no coaching experience in the endurance field. <laughs> Pretty weird, right? Well, clearly it didn't matter because his sons have gone on to be European champions, world champions, Olympic champions, and even have some world records. Now, both of these men have come to the same conclusion that threshold training is the king for endurance performance. So maybe let's make some sense of all this stuff. There are three key aspects of running performance that you should know about. VO2 max, threshold, and economy. VO2 max is the limit of your aerobic system to supply oxygen to your muscles and move blood around your body. Now, some athletes have a VO2 max of 90, and we won't get into the numbers too much, but 90 is insane. And I guarantee that the Norwegian athletes all have very similar VO2 maxes to this. And to put that in context, I would estimate that my own VO2 max is probably around 59 or 58, something around there. And here's a fun fact for you. Some Alaskan Huskies actually have a VO2 max of 200. Humans suck. So there's different ways that this blood supply and blood delivery can actually be restricted. For example, blood supply can actually be limited by your stroke volume and cardiac output of your heart. Basically how much blood your heart can pump. But your VO2 max can also be limited by how efficient your mitochondria are at pulling all of this oxygen out of your blood and into the muscles. And that's all great, but here's the problem. We don't race at our VO2 max. It's pretty much impossible to run at our VO2 max for longer than five or six minutes. So this measure is pretty useless for most runners. And having a high VO2 max might not be the most efficient for most runners. That's because your body has to spend way more time at a given intensity moving this big heart muscle. And so outside of that five or six minute time range, having a really high VO2 max can actually be a detriment to your running performance. So here's the problem that we have to solve. If a high VO2 max is such an energy drain and doesn't actually help you much with your running performance over six minutes, then what can we actually do to get faster? We need to focus on our economy and capacity or aerobic capacity. Even back in the 1980s, scientists were finding correlations between race times and aerobic capacity. Pretty interesting stuff. And one thing to understand in in endurance sports is that it is a muscular activity because our muscles power ourselves through the particular movements. It's not just the power of our heart and our lungs. So we can improve our performance significantly by only improving our aerobic capacity. And we do this with threshold training. And this is the same conclusion that Olav and Gert came to. So how does it work? So everyone's heard of zone two running, which is basically our easy running where we're building all of our aerobic system. Well, in this threshold system, there's basically only three zones and your zone two is actually zone one. Because in this zone, we're chilling, and the physiological definition of chilling means that our lactate levels are staying pretty low. Now, like I said, there are only three zones, but some people have five zones, some people have seven, some people have one, some people have zero, because blood lactate is a continuum. I don't know, I'm just gonna stick with three. Now, if we plot blood lactate on the y-axis and exercise intensity on the x-axis, we can see that the blood lactate slowly creeps up as exercise gets harder before spiking 
really quickly. And this spike is what we call a big blow up and we do not want that in our sessions. Now there is what they call a first lactate turn point, which is when the blood lactate levels go higher than two millimoles. And we call that our aerobic threshold. So anything lower than this two millimole blood lactate level, we're gonna call zone one. Now as this lactate starts to accumulate, at four millimoles, it starts to rapidly take off. And we call that our second lactate turn point or LT2 or our anaerobic threshold. So anything below this and above our LT1 is our zone two. And anything above four millimoles is zone three. Pretty straightforward, right? Now this is why we see athletes during their sessions finger pricking themselves with lactate machines. So that they can make sure that they're in between this two millimole to four millimole boundary or zone two. And this is so important for threshold training. Here's why. When we train in this zone, we improve our body's ability to clear lactate from the blood, which is gonna improve our performance. Blood lactate accumulation is a physiological outcome of breaking down the molecule pyruvate and it's leftover hydrogen ions that limit our performance as our intramuscular environment becomes more acidic. This training improves our body's ability to clear lactate, which means that we can run closer to our VO2 max without getting fatigued. And it's actually been shown in some studies that running 10% faster than your anaerobic threshold is four times more fatiguing than running 10% under your lactate threshold. And this is the beauty of threshold training because it's so much less fatiguing than VO2 max workouts. You can do a lot more of it. And when I say a lot more, I mean it. Let's have a look at what the Norwegians do. So let's start with the Ingebrigtsen brothers. Believe it or not, it's a little bit less complex because it's only one sport compared to three. And right here is where we can see the classic Norwegian double threshold days. On the surface, it seems pretty insane, right? having so much intensity on one day. Well, they have two specific reasons why they stack threshold sessions like this on the same day. Reason number one, it allows you to do more threshold without too much fatigue. On Tuesday, for example, we can see that they've done six rounds of five minutes at threshold. Not too bad, right? I'm sure that you've done a session with 30 minutes of quality work in it. Because they aren't doing a massive amount of intensity during each session, it means that they can take it easy in the morning and then come back again for a second threshold session at night. And this is the case on the Tuesday where they'd come back at night to do 10 rounds of one kilometer, which once again is gonna be around 25 to 30 minutes of intensity for them. So basically it's much easier to recover from two mini sessions than one mega session. And here's reason number two. It allows them to keep their easy days easy. Because they stack all of their intensity into specific days of the week, it means that the other days they can go really slow and really relaxed and make sure that they're recovering 100% before the next day. Because they understand that recovery is just as important as the intensity. Now their morning session is a little bit more relaxed as they cap their lactate at two millimoles. And if we remember from before, this two millimole number actually correlates more with our LT1 or our aerobic threshold zone. Now the second session is where they pick it up a bit, aiming for a lactate measurement of around 3.5 millimoles, which is closer to that four millimole barrier. Pretty cool stuff, right? Well, the key with the Ingebrigtsen sessions is that they're restrained and they make sure that they're patient throughout the workouts. Now here's where it gets a little bit more complex for triathletes, but the concept is still the exact same. Tuesdays and Thursdays are still their double threshold days, but during one week, they'll do a double run threshold day on Tuesday and a double cycling threshold day on Thursday. And the week after they'll swap them around. Along with their threshold days, they would also do triathlon-like routines where they would do a 60K ride, a 20K run and a 2K swim in one day. What the hell? These dudes, as well as the Ingebrigtsen brothers, are absolute monsters. But their calculated approach into maximizing each session and also maximizing their recovery is what makes them even better athletes. So how can we achieve the same results from threshold training and the Norwegian method? So here's the training plan that I've been using, generally speaking, over the last couple of months. Plus or minus a couple of sessions here and there when I was training for my half marathon and also some 10K specific sessions when I was training for a 10K. But I've always had at least one threshold session per week. Currently, I'm focusing on hitting my higher end threshold session on Tuesday, where I'm doing three minute sets with one minute break. And that intensity range is between my half marathon and my 10K race pace. On Thursdays is when I'm doing my longer, slower threshold sessions, where I'm doing reps from five to eight minutes in length. And those reps are gonna be slightly slower than my half marathon pace. And here's probably a good time to mention that I usually do about 70% slow, easy running during the week. So I'm still getting in my aerobic base building stuff. Now here's how I found my threshold paces. I've used race results as well as one hour time trials to find my maximum running pace in ideal conditions. I then correlated that with a few months of heart rate data and I found that my threshold zone is from 155 to 170 beats per minute. And my threshold pace is gonna be anywhere from 340 to 345 per kilometer. 
for not only athletes, this is the best way that I've found to get us close enough to those threshold ranges without having to do really expensive lab tests. And to be honest, close enough is good enough. And I've seen crazy progress without the lab tests. Now, if you wanna learn a few more tips on how to get faster this year, then you're gonna to have to watch this next video. So go get stuck into it. Enjoy.